All right. Okay, so what I wanted to do just very, very briefly um, is look at some visual techniques because particularly next year when you do distinctively visual, your related text can be an artwork. It can be a photo, it can be a, a, um, a painting, like an Australian painting. Um, it can be, you know, a, a, an image from a movie. So we need to know when we're thinking about how do writers write visually, we need to sort of be able to relate that to visual techniques. Um, back in the rubric it also said that when you compose pieces in response to this unit, you can do it in a variety of forms and media. So it may be that for the assessment task we may be getting you to do something in terms of a film trailer or something to do with creating a film. So visual techniques are really important for this module because we need to understand how when we look at a picture, if you look at these posters on the wall, what grabs us? Which is the poster that you look at first? Which is the one that sort of catches your eye? And what is it about that particular poster that catches your eye? Maybe it's not the same poster as the person next to you, who's, you know, what they're looking at. So we need to understand in a visual sense, if you're looking at a film or looking at a painting, what works, what grabs you, what evokes those feelings of, of what's being conveyed. And then we can put that into the sense of, okay, well, that's how visual people do it. How do writers do it? How do they convey a really great picture that grabs you just using words? Okay, so visual techniques. Have a look at this, um, this example. So it's obviously sort of a modern abstract painting and it's, it represents a family. But you'll see that the artist has used a number of techniques to convey that idea of family. You know, there, there are no faces, there's no facial expression. We can, we can sense that they're human forms, even though they're modern and abstract, but we still get that feeling of togetherness. We still get that feeling of, you know, drawing in. So a few techniques that you could point out, and I'll go through these with you. Um, salience. So when we talk about the salient object, we're talking about the object in an image that is the first thing to attract your attention or your eye is drawn to it. Okay, so yeah, salience is that part that your eyes are first drawn to in the visual. Colour can affect salience, um, the image, like the size and the layout. So, you know, in terms of the family being the only objects with nothing in the background, nothing in the foreground, obviously the salient object we were drawn to, you know, is this group of people. For some people, you know, maybe the red person stands out most because that's the colour that grabs their attention. The person sitting next to you might look at the green figure. So it, there can be slight differences in salience. There's not always a right or wrong answer. But in this image, I would say the salient object is the group of, of figures. Obviously, we've got no facial expression in this image, but we do have gestures or body position. So as I said, you can see them all leaning in towards the centre. You know, it's nearly as though this is mum and dad and these are the two kids all gathering in for a hug. Um, and that conveys the attitude, feelings or personality of the individual shown. Um, if there is a face, always look at eye direction. Often, particularly in, in um, early Australian paintings, the, the direction of somebody's eyes is telling you something. Maybe they're looking off into the distance at, you know, a dog or something and that tells you something of the story. So eye direction is always a really good one. And colours, obviously, used to signify feelings and evoke a response in you. Okay, so black and white images will use light and dark and shade to convey feelings. Um, of, often colours are used you know, in the same way. Red can be anger, blue can be calm, you know, green can be peaceful. Okay, so angle and framing, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit down, down the track. As I said, body language and gaze, you know, that signifies the personality of the individual shower. Um, if they're looking off into the distance, there will be a reason for it. If they're looking at their feet, there's a reason for it. So when you look at an image, look at every aspect. Start with the salient object, but then look for little details around the edges or in the background because both visual artists and authors, when they put together a text, they always do everything for a purpose. Nothing's just hit and miss. So I'll tell you a little bit later about, you know, the process of writing and Tim Winton's struggle to get the final product. Everything is always carefully considered. 
So the composition, so that's what's included in an image. Um, and again, deliberately placed. The composition's never, you know, unless it's, you know, a, a one in a million shot, you know, a, a, you know, by chance. It's always deliberately placed. And it also applies to what's left out. Um, so look, as I say, when you look at an image, you consider everything that's included and ask yourself, what, why is it there? Okay, this is the sun baker. That's that photo I was telling you about. Do you guys recognise that? Or am I just really old and you don't know that one? No? Righto. Very famous image. Um, it's often on postcards and it's in, um, I think it's in the National Gallery still. It was a few years ago in down in Canberra. What's the salient object in this one? Yep, the head, yep, or the, or the guy, you know, the sunbaker. There's not much around, is there? Um, look at the angle. Well, how, what do you, how do you think the photographer got this image? What do you think he was doing? Yeah, lying down? Yep. Yep, so he would have been on, on the sand as well with the camera right on his level. Um, the angle at which an image is taken or, or you know, the, the perspective from which it's painted has an effect on meaning, which I'll, I'll talk about. Body language, is this guy stressed out of his head? No. No, he's chilling, isn't he? He's relaxing. He's going to get sunburned, but he's relaxing. And composition, you know, the photographer has carefully thought about that. You know, we've got a lot of sand here, so obviously we've got that perspective of him out on the same level. Um, but in the background, you've got the vast expanse, and that, you know, evokes that beautiful, you know, clear, white Australian beach that goes on forever. There aren't crowds around him, there's nothing going on and you know, no high-rise building, it's, it's just that beautiful, peaceful moment of a guy enjoying nature. Alright, colour, hue and tone, as I said, black and white uses light and, and, and dark um, and shading to convey emotion. The darker it is, you know, the darker the emotion. In a colour image, we've got feelings and emotions that correlate to colours, so red could be anger, um, blue, peace and harmony. And contrast, the arrangement of opposite elements. So, you know, maybe light and dark, small and large, rough and smooth, creates interest, excitement or drama or points out the distinct differences. So sometimes, you know, a painting might have a beautifully dressed lady, um, you know, and a swaggy next to her. And, you know, that really creates that contrast of, you know, the, the, the British settlers and how they were dressed and, and lived their life in early Australia compared to you know, some of the workers who were in amongst the Australian environment. So you know, look at all those aspects and as I said, look at everything and ask why it's, why it's been included. All right, look picture of Cinderella there. So colour, what, what do you think that blue dress is, is evoking? Sorry, calm and happy? Yep, awesome, yep. Yeah, she's not wearing, you know, a bright red and black sort of strappy dress like a villain. She's wearing a very pretty, soft, pale blue dress. Um, interesting, I don't know if you guys know this, before, I think it was about before 1900, little girls were dressed in blue because that was the colour of the Virgin Mary's gown. And little boys were dressed in sort of a pale red, so nearly pink. They, they were the traditional colours. Um, and it was actually Walt Disney with the, you know, the, 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 the princesses in the pink that actually swapped that connotation around. So Walt Disney, again, he's had huge impacts on our culture. He took it from little girls wear blue to little girls wear pink. And that's, that's how it changed. So this dress was probably before the Walt Disney pink fetish. So the, the, the pale blue dress represented an innocent girl, a little girl, even though she's an adult. And contrast, you know, when you have a look, we've got the salient object is Cinderella. But there's lot, there are lots of little critters, little mice and little butterflies, you know, cruising around her feet and around her head. So we've got that, that contrast in size, you know, a human and animal. And, you know, you have to ask what are the animals doing? Why are they dancing around her feet? And why are they wearing clothes? All right, framing. So framing is the same camera shots and angles relevant to film. So if you've done film studies and you know about, you know, low angle, low, um, angle and high angle, Close-ups, extreme close-ups. So you know anything shot from below, looking up, conveys image, conveys um, power, control, prestige. If you're looking down on an object, it's as though they're quite insignificant, as though you possess the power. When you're doing a close-up, you're really focusing the audience onto facial expressions or whatever the object is that's that's part of the close-up. And long shots are trying to convey to you an image of the breadth of the landscape. So you know how movies often start with a long shot you know, of New York City 
So immediately you as an audience member think, oh, this story's in New York, right, and then it hones in on the character. So all very, very precise, always used for a specific purpose. And when we get into Tim Winton, we'll sort of see that he kind of does the same with words. You know, he can start with a broad description of the landscape, and for Winton, landscape is always the first thing. That's the big thing that matters. Then he'll hone in and sort of do his close-up on the character. So it gives us as an audience an idea of, oh, right, okay, this story's set in WA on the, on the beach, and now we're coming in onto Vic Lang or whoever the main character is. As I said before, sometimes what's left out is just as is just as relevant as what's as what's in. Um, you know, it might be a, an image of a family, but there's no dad or no mum, and that's telling a story. Someone's missing. Orientation or point of view, so that relates to the framing. You know, the the, the angle um, is the responder, like are you positioned above or below the object? Like that sun baker I just showed you, you're on his level. So you immediately feel like you're sunbaking on the beach too. So you feel the heat and you feel the sand on your skin. You know, if you're positioned above, you're going to feel quite superior. If you're below, you're going to be looking up and feeling a bit intimidated. So that's just some examples. There's a Hitler, so here we are as the little minions down below looking up at him. Um, that image of, of, you know, from looking down onto the soldiers, we feel like we're on his level. It's not that we would ever want to be, but you know, we're, we're looking down onto the soldiers. So perspective makes us feel very, very different. And Tim Winton does the same thing. The perspective that he puts us in makes us respond differently. All right, we're getting there, guys. Positioning. So think about, you know, in an image, where have things been positioned? So often things in the foreground are the most important, and in a um, as I say, uh, down here in the rule of thirds, if you divide an image into thirds, often the, image, the, the images in the top third are considered the most important um, and empowered, you know, they have the most power. And the people in the bottom third, going across horizontally, they have the least power. Do you want me to start <coughs> a bit so you can write notes? Am I going a bit fast? No. No? All good? All right, thank you. Okay, so you have a look at that picture of that family. So if we're looking at positioning, we would say, you know, obviously there's a lot of people and they've all been crammed together. Um, so it's obviously, we've got to get the whole family in, so it's important that this photo is a photo of a family. Um, when you look at the rule of thirds, obviously these older siblings, they're, they're the most important in terms of power. And the poor old water bottle, that's totally insignificant. But it's there for a reason, so showing that it's a picnic, showing that it's you know, a fairly casual photo, just a family snap. Well, okay, salience, we've already done that, and that's always, a, you know, if you're ever writing about visual technique, salience is a, is a very important one. So what's the salient object? What's that thing that grabs your attention? And symbolism. Sometimes an image can you be used to represent something else. So, you know, think of when you buy a card at the newsagent, you're going to a wedding, you immediately know the wedding cards because it's two rings intertwined or a big heart or a dove flying off with a bell or something and you know that's a wedding card. So images can convey something else and immediately as soon as you see that image or that symbol, you know that's what it's getting at. Um, so symbolism can be using an image that's, you know, like when we we're talking about denotation, that is, you know, it is what it is but it's used to symbolise something else. And the classic example is this one, the photograph famous one that you guys have probably seen after 9-11. So if somebody said, what is it? What are we, what are we talk, looking at? You'd say, well, obviously this is all the rubble of, of the um, World Trade Center in the background. We've got firefighters down here below. The salient object, what would you guys say the salient flag. object is? Flag. The flag, yeah, so this lopsided flagpole and the flag, and the firefighters amidst all the rubble are raising the flag, okay? So that's objectively, factually, what it is. What does it? What does that image sort of evoke in terms of feelings for you guys? What, have a bash. What's the photographer trying to sort of say with that photo? Yeah, yep, yeah, awesome. Yep, so the American flag. They're saying amidst all this rubble, we're still raising the American flag. We are going to get back on our feet and we're going to live through this and we're going to come back stronger. 
So that's this, that's what I mean by symbolism. You have to read into it and say, well, you know, what what meaning is this photographer? What's he really trying to say to us? Okay. Um, and the symbol is absolutely the flag. All right, vectors. Vectors are the lines um, that our eyes take when we look at an image. So if you think of an image of ten very tall straight pine trees in a row, the vectors are vertical lines going up and down. If, however, you're looking at sand dunes rippling across, you know, a photo of sand dunes, you're going to have a look at the vectors going horizontally across the page. So, as I said before, composers always put everything in deliberately, unless it's, you know, as I say, a photo of a plane crash or something that just happens on the spot. If it's an artistic piece, everything is always either in there or not in there for a reason. Um, so, as I say, that, you know, the vectors are the way that the the composer wants you to look. He wants you, or he, he or she wants you to look up or down. Wants you to look across. So here's an example I'll just show you. So vectors in this picture. We've got, we've got kind of two happening. It's kind of interesting. I think the salient object, I don't know if you guys agree, do you think it's the trees? Would you say the salient object? No? What's the view in the sun? Light. The light? Yep. See, everyone can have a different interpretation. So when we're looking at the trees, our eyes are going up and down, we're getting a sense of, wow, this is a tall forest, this is an old forest. Um, the light, as you say, coming across, that sort of, that makes us think, you know, the sun's obviously over there, it's, it's either early morning or dusk, and the sun's really coming in. And then we notice this, this woman or this child in a white dress. So white symbolises, what do you think white symbolises? Wedding brides get married in white? Was that an answer? Purity. Purity, absolutely, yep. White symbolises purity, innocence. I'll have to bring chockies in and throw them at people.